Right. Okay. Um, I think what I'll do is, first of all, we'll kick off and, and talk a little bit about brand personality. And then I want to talk about COVID communications and we'll go to breakout. Okay. Um, let me just check the chat, see if anyone's talking to me. Nope. All good. Um, if there's any issues along the way, sound quality, dropout, complications, uh, just simply uh, fire off a message in chat to everyone and um, I will uh, reply. Um, act on it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about brand personality. And this time around, because I'm, I'm very conscious of the problem I had last week with trying to show the keynote slides and the slides didn't advance. I was complaining to a friend of mine who teaches at Sophia University and also at Keo. And he said when he was teaching at Keo, precisely the same time periods uh, for um, and into five, in Keo last week had exactly the same problem. So I think it's an issue of the rollout of Zoom's version five that it wasn't working well. And my colleague, Shu Min Sensei, had a similar issue. So his advice was simply to uh, run the presentations off uh, the PDF. So I'm going to show you the PDF, which is exactly what you've got as well. So I'll scroll through. Okay. So a little bit about brand personality in general. Uh, it is a little bit controversial in branding, whether we can think of a company, a nation, a place, uh, or, you know, a product, a branded product, uh, having attributes in some sense like a human personality. Of course, this is all about how other people perceive it. And the response to that is just simply that human beings are hardwired to see things in human terms. This is why we can project personality onto Nui Gurumi, on um, you know cute stuffed uh, characters, animals, and whatnot. We tend to anthropomorphize things. That uh, we invest personality in things that are actually non-human. We uh, very often attribute a whole range of emotional sophistication to animals, for example, and the animals may not in fact be um, thinking or feeling what we think they do, but we tend to read their body language in certain ways. One of, one of the interesting things that has been quite a serious discussion is about dolphins and how uh, so many people want to save the dolphins because dolphins look so intelligent and they seem to be happy because they look like they're smiling. Um, Dolphins are actually really, really vicious animals. They pack rape, they uh, murder, they, uh, they do a lot of really, really brutal things to their fellow dolphins. Um, but there's something about the shape of their mouths where human beings look at them and think that they're incredibly cute. And if anyone knows that 1970s television program Flipper from the United States, you know that um, they're also perceived to be not just cheery and the friends of humans, but also incredibly um, intelligent. Uh, there's a bit of misunderstanding of intelligence, by the way. They're supposedly they've got big brains relative to their bodies, but recent research shows that the big brain is primarily fat to keep their uh, limited brain cells kind of warm. So we tend to project anyway uh, onto them human attributes. Uh, I mentioned the example of uh, Tom Hanks in the film Castaway, uh, where he's all by himself on, a, on an island and his bloody handprint on a basketball, which was a Winston brand, had something like a human face uh, element to it. So he started talking to it and that became his best friend, Winston. And there's a very sad scene in the movie where Winston washes away and he loses his best friend, but it was actually a basketball. So we do uh, project personality onto even inanimate objects. We often see um, human faces in various places, such as the moon. Um, although in Japan, traditionally, people see a rabbit in the moon. Uh, in Western countries, we often see the old man in the moon. So uh, maybe this is because we evolved in small social groups, having to coordinate socially to survive, coming together as a band to hunt a woolly mammoth, for example. So we may have these personalizing tendencies. So I've just put in the slides very briefly an overview of the main way that psychologists explore personality these days, these big five uh, factors. 
and just running through them, openness to experience, uh, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness are all considered to be positive um, aspects. The one that is negative is neuroticism, mostly negative. It uh, can uh, lead to caution, risk averseness, some of the things that work quite well, for example, in a pandemic. Okay. Um, but the neuroticism thing, you know, it's, it's not a good thing to score too highly on neuroticism in general. So we're not really going to get into a discussion of that, just simply to flag that that's the dominant model of understanding personality these days. Um, I just want to say one thing, though, about the methodology in which so the field of psychology has arrived at thinking about individual personality. It was an interesting turn several decades ago in psychology. Uh, Historically, psychologists tend to, based on patient observation in a very Sigmund Freud way or a uh, Jung way, Jungian way, um, worked from uh, rich descriptions of typically what was understood as psychological disorders through treating patients as a professional psychologist. This did two things. Um, it absolutely privilege, privileged the psychologist as, the, as this brilliant uh, uh, discerner of individual psychological states of personality and also to pontificate, to, to, to theorize the foundations um, of their personality. And of course, Sigmund Freud encapsulates this probably more than anyone as a methodology. Several decades ago, the, uh, the switch was a significant one away towards more typically social scientific approaches of larger data, larger samples. Um, but then this question is, well, what do you actually work on? And one of, the, one of the concerns in psychology was when they were talking about psychological states, they're almost completely focused on disorders. When you start from a professional practice of actually treating people, you're looking at the, uh, the problem, problematized, the, the troubled personality. And so there was a pushback and saying, well, let's try and make sense of, of the vast majority of people who have relatively you know, well-balanced psychological states and to try and understand that. And so a shift towards positive psychology, but also in terms of big data, what were they going to study? So how do you actually get your mind around um, in, in a way that represents large samples, uh, personality. And the way the psychologists arrived at was actually to very much focus at communications and particularly to focus at language and to say, well, all cultures in their languages embody understandings about the human condition, about human psychology. And so what they did was they effectively did textual analysis, um, content analysis, which looked at the way personalities and differences in personality were described in different languages. So a lot of data analysis of language itself. So, you know, how do individual societies, cultures really talk about the differences in personality between individuals and then to compare that across societies. And if you find systematic patterns, in the way that very different cultures, very different languages describe differences in personality, then you may be on to something in terms of the universal nature of the structure of human personality. And so that's very much where the five factors come from, this kind of sense of openness, you know, inventive, curious, for example, um, and generally um, open to emotion, adventure, curiosity, variety of experience, as it says here in the slide. Um, conscientiousness, of course, you know, self-discipline, responsibility, planning rather than spontaneous behavior. And you can see that there can be tensions between the two, obviously. Um, the extroversion, uh, introversion thing, I think we all get, uh, outgoing versus, for example, shyer. Uh, across all cultures, it's, it's, it's a very familiar distinction. By the way, there's a huge boom in the um, neglect in publishing now about the neglected importance of the introvert in society. So if you're if you're not an extrovert, 
don't get worried about that. Actually, uh, recently, there's been a lot of studies given to the problems associated with extroversion, um, particularly because people are all talk and less substance very often, and uh, it can be associated with a whole range of problems, particularly in leaders. Then there's agreeableness, of course, you know, how compassionate, kind and whatnot, open to other people. I mean, we can see that it's separate from openness to experience, it's openness to other people, to their pain, to their suffering, empathy, and how then that manifests in your behavioral response to it. And then of course, neuroticism, um, the tendency to experience unpleasant emotions e easily, such as anger, anxiety, depression, vulnerability that we see in the slides there. And I've taken this straight from Wikipedia. Uh, the Wikipedia entry is incredibly rich. One, one interesting thing is the psychology field is very strongly internally divided. Um, and they're always very strictly as a discipline, it's a huge discipline of policing the boundaries of knowledge and the knowledge within their field. So some of you may wonder about, are there systematic differences uh, in terms of pers the prevalence of personality types across cultures? And there has been some studies done on this. Uh, there's a very nice summary that you can find on the BBC. The BBC has this series, the written BBC, of course, the published BBC, uh, has this interesting series which summarise uh, recent academic work relevant to a range of social issues. So if you Google this, you'll find this uh, very easily. Um, what is interesting is actually Japan comes out as being right at the top of international rankings in terms of neuroticism and actually very, very low in terms of agreeableness. Um, there's also a separate Gallup poll survey on kindness to strangers. And I'm sorry to say that Japan comes out typically around the second or third to the bottom. On the other hand, Japan comes out as quite kind to in-group. That's a cliche about Japan, but in-group versus outside it's not tannin ni yasashukunai Okay, so there is something in terms of the universality of personality types. There is certainly something in the tendency of humans to project onto objects and entities, whether it's a company, an organization, a nation, a people in the abstract, to project personality um, onto them. One interesting finding from some of the research though, and particularly that study there by Schmidt and, and his uh, co-authors, is that there are systematic differences across cultures in terms of the frequency of certain personality types, but it doesn't actually match very neatly the cliches about national personality. So we're getting some perceptions about what, say, the typical person from France or Germany or whatever is, uh, or from Greece, for example, which doesn't accord necessarily with studies of uh, personality differences across culture and some other classic studies of cross-cultural differences as well. You know, we have an image of Greece and the Greeks as all being very relaxed and uh, the home of democracy and, and whatnot, um, almost the, the quintessential easygoing um, uh, Mediterranean uh, pers persona. Uh, and indeed, uh, an old adage, and it's actually borne out in research, is in Europe, uh, people like the Greeks and respect the Germans and not the other way around, okay? Um, what you actually find in a, in a range of cultural studies is that within Greece, Greece actually is a quite status hierarchical society, quite interestingly, um, which might run contrary to some of the cliches about, about Greece. And that was a result that was um, shown up in a very famous uh, methodology by a guy called Geert Hofstede, who's done comparative cultural studies. So, uh, we get perceptions of personality from a range of places that are not necessarily grounded in truth. That's actually very significant from a communications design perspective, because what it means is that at very least there is the possibility that you can nudge perceptions of a brand's personality in a more favorable uh, direction. So what we're talking about when we talk about brand personality, we're talking about how it's perceived by the customers and how it's understood and projected by a business. Okay. So in, when we talk about communication design, we're hoping to take control of the way we are perceived or at least influence the way that we are perceived. This is, this is the critical strategic and tactical objective here. 
Now we do know with brands, it's very clear that perceptions across customers can vary across market segments, time. A couple of examples I've got here, Clark shoes. When I was a kid, Clark's is a brand completely associated with school shoes. I came to Japan and found that Clark's were quite premium priced um, and a very different product line. Dr. Martens, of course, um, they started off as workman's shoes, uh, industrial shoes. Uh, the soles are resistant to chemicals and industrial plant floors, and the uh, the leather is tough. The steel steel cap toes, for example, to protect uh, people if they drop heavy equipment. Then uh, Dr. Martens started making uh, a version of them, not a boot but uh, a regular shoe for the police force in the UK. Then later on, bands such as the Sex Pistols, punk bands uh, took uh, ownership of Doc Martens and turned them in, of course, into a, um, an edgy youth brand. Still lots of young people wear Doc Martens, um, hugely popular brand, uh, but there's a whole bunch of uh, aging people like me who grew up with uh, punk music in the early 1980s. And uh, if you can't afford to have the Harley Davidson, the midlife crisis, you wear Doc Martens instead. Okay. What is really significant is firms can lose control over the cultural meanings and the perceived personality of their brands. Sometimes it's just a, um, it's just a negative association that arises because a certain kinds of consumers start buying your product. Uh, Sometimes it's tactical mistakes. Uh, Dolce & Gabbana, the Italian fashion brand, they did those um, D and G buckles. And uh, that was a kind of entry level product which a lot of people could buy. And they became very popular amongst a demographic that would never have spent money on the Dolce & Gabbana clothing in general. And so D and G ended up a little bit stigmatized by their entry level product. And this is an ongoing question. On the one hand, do you want some cheaper priced product, accessories and whatnot that allow people to engage with the brands. For example, Tiffany has done very, very well with a range of cheaper, instantly recognizable rings and necklaces, for example, to try and build a lifelong association with the brand. Um, if you do that, though, if, you, if you're too cheap, then there is the danger that certain segments who, to be honest, might stigmatize your brand uh, are going to adopt it on the observations of in some countries is that the big DNG buckle is um, associated with drug dealers in seedy areas um, by, uh, by the, uh, the, the dark back streets of stations in European cities. So really what corporate communication design is about trying to define in the first place um, and then position and project a brand's personality in public space. This in itself requires an internal conversation. What are we? What, what are our values? What do we want to say uh, to the world? How do we want to be perceived? What is us? Um, a friend of mine uh, goes regularly to a local coffee roaster, uh, but he's particularly fussy. He's always telling the, uh, the coffee roaster in Tokyo to roast it in a way that he likes it, but the coffee roaster doesn't really want to do. And eventually one day the roaster said, yeah, that's not us, okay? Uh, and, then, and he pushed back quite rightly. Uh, because, of course, the coffee roaster have their own particular aesthetic. They want to be associated with a certain style, with a certain, with a certain flavor or a certain approach to the product. And if they go too far down the path of what we call co-creation, -cre co just collaborating with your users, um, you're in danger of losing a sense of what you are. Uh, you're a little bit to everybody but nothing substantial and unique to anybody at the same time. So that's, that's, that's a perilous thing that you uh, end up uh, like the old Japanese expression, hapo bijin. So the, the beautiful person who looks in eight directions. So you're not particularly focused essentially on, on your unique prospect. So you have to keep tight control of your brand identity and positioning even if you do actively engage with your audiences, and we, we will talk about that. So we still see that many premium brands, brands exert very tight control. Co-creation is a fatty term, but Apple doesn't do co-creation. Many Lux brands don't. Later on in the semester, we'll see how particularly how 
previously very closed, very defensive, exclusive French brands have been selectively admitting largely friendly media into their production houses so that people can see the value creation function. It's not about co-creation. It's more about opening up the, uh, the process really to project brand narratives so that people really understand the, uh, the artisanship for, uh, and creative processes involved, partly so that people will continue to pay the, uh, the premium. So um, in terms of brand personality, and give me just a moment here. Yep. Okay. So in terms of brand personality, so how is it expressed? Well, it's expressed through overall design and the production ethos through the materiality and the aesthetics of the product. Uh, it's just simply the, the touch, the feel of a product. Uh, we'll see in so many ways that you know, if you want to communicate environmental sense, sensibility and sensitivity, uh, sustainability, that's got to manifest in the product that attributes the experience of, of the product. Um, sometimes this actually um, overprivileges uh, you know, the, uh, 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 an obvious, a, a too obvious display of materials being recycled, for example. Um, you, know, you, you can have perfectly effective recycled white paper, but uh, somehow that kind of brown, rough textured paper actually looks more genuinely kind of recycled. So ultimately the uh, um, perceptions are on the side of the customer and there are always tactical issues there and a communications challenge involved. But the materiality and the aesthetics of the product have to manifest the brand personality. So. Also the values and visual and other language embodied in the corporate communications are going to be critical. The associations, who you associate your brand with, who do you have as sponsors, who, who, you know, who, if you're a designer, are you dressing, for example, will have a huge impact on the brand personality that you're uh, projecting. This is always controversial. Um, it's not enough that you just have any celebrity endorse your product. It has to be someone that really fits with your brand identity, with your brand personality and with your target market, of course. And those things are completely inseparable. Inseparable. So association with subcultures and with other products and brands, and this becomes a very interesting thing. You know, um, to a significant degree, you are who you are seen with. I'm afraid, in terms of the world of perceptions. And so, where do you retail your product? It, it where, what kind of stores stock it? Uh, is your product? Uh, positioning, its identity, your brand personality are to be enhanced by the outlets that you're using. Okay, so just a couple of examples in terms of brand narratives. One of the immediately important things to remember is the distinction between a company and its brands. Now, a company has its own brand in the sense of it's, it's named and of course, the company can be synonymous with the, uh, the brand. You will see Nissan, for example. But of course, Nissan has Infinity and it has Datsun, which is an old brand that is brought back. Now, some companies run a completely different strategy, partly because they've really grown by acquisition, that they've bought many other established companies and they've inherited the brands. And so they end up running a portfolio of brands, very diverse portfolio of brands. This is often a very deliberate strategy to create new brands which speak to different markets that have very distinctive personalities, positions, um, very distinctive associations, just to speak to those different market segments. It can be associated with very different ethos, for example. Um, Shiseido historically has done this. Uh, there's always a, uh, a dilemma for companies. If the name of the company is put over every product there are huge efficiencies in terms of investing in projecting that brand and getting brand recognition. And if you have one very successful product, it can help to lift other products. The reverse is equally true. You have one dud product and it damages the brand uh, across the whole range. Many years ago uh, here, when I first came to Sills, I coordinated a uh, a course once for a colleague who was away, now retired, uh, called the International Role of Japanese Business. It still exists, and uh, Shino Sensei now, now runs it. I, I looked after it three times in total. And 
The first time we did it, we had a top executive from uh, Hitachi who went on to be the CEO of Hitachi and is now the head of Kedanren. And one of the striking things that he told students in his presentation in SILS was that um, Hitachi home products, electrical appliances, washing machines, refrigerators, and things like that, had to be incredibly good quality. They had to be extremely reliable because they put their brand on them. And he said, you know, if we're trying to sell, at the time they were in the business of, of building even nuclear power stations, but uh, building power stations. If, if uh, you're building a power station or a, or a huge dam or something, uh, the electrical generators for a dam or something like that, project that's worth $100 million or $200 million, you're trying to pitch to get this huge project. You don't want the person on the other side in a really bad mood because his Hitachi washing machine broke down on the weekend and he hasn't got a clean shirt to wear. I mean, the way he described it was, of course, it was a bit of a oyaji perspective. He said, you know, that uh, you, go, you go to sell the power plant and the, the, uh, the CEO on the other side of the table is grumpy because his wife's giving him a hard time that the Hitachi washing machine broke. So the implication here, of course, is that uh, at least if companies are very alert to this brand risk, then it can be a very good value to buy an entry-level product that they are prepared to put their brand on if they are alert to the fact that, that making that product badly will impact on their brand reputation in a whole range of other segments. There's a very interesting anecdote about Steve Jobs. He told the CEO of Nike that he loved their product, and you'd know that um, Steve Jobs used to give presentations all the time wearing uh, um, sneakers and jeans. And uh, he explicitly told the CEO of Nike, says, love your product, some of your product. Stop putting your brand on your crap product. You make great product, you make crap product. Stop selling crap product with your brand on it. And I heard this first in relation to Sony, that Sony sells headphones for 200,000 yen, um, but also puts their brand on headphones that cost 800 yen. And if someone gets 800 yen Sony headphones and they sound pretty bad, that may work against their preparedness to, to pay more. A lot of it depends on, on how much customers understand this dynamic and recognize the various price points. Of course, there are cases where companies have a brand, that, or the name of the company that nobody knows. Most people have not heard of Luxottica. It is a huge Italian company. It is the largest owner of sunglasses, sunglasses brands, the largest manufacturer in the world. It is an absolute giant in the glasses, in the glasses frame industry, okay? Um, myriad brands, Oakley, Ray-Ban, Persil, Prada, so many others. Of course, Ray-Ban seems to be an iconic American brand, and it is. Um, and it goes right back, right back to making sunglasses for um, aviators in the lead up to World War II, for example. But of course, it was bought by Exotica. Now, if you go to one of those stores in an airport, not now because we can't travel, but if you go to one of those sunglasses stores in an airport, typically say the sunglasses hut, um, you're not only buying only Luxottica product, product, you are buying them through Luxottica. A large proportion of the glasses retailers, particularly in airport spaces and in uh, malls in America and Europe, are in fact Luxottica. You are in Luxottica world. So when you look around and you see a huge array of glasses, different, different styles, different designs, and they all seem to be pretty expensive and you say, well, this must be the market price for glasses. You have to realize that there's only one company there. You are dealing with just one supplier with a huge portfolio of brands. So let's turn to this question then of under one brand projecting multiple personalities. It is possible. We do see the car industry tending to work this way, but effectively they create sub-brands. So if we look at in the Nissan's case, and I use Nissan because I teach a corporate case study of Nissan, and I have been doing so since 2006. Uh, yeah, 2006. 
And so we see very distinctive brands with distinctive positioning. It's the, uh, the Z or the Z, the GTR, sports, very striking sports car, um, referred to as Godzilla uh, by car lovers, the X-Trail, the Datsun brand, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, brands that have been around for the long, longest time, Sunny, Bluebird, and, and many others. Okay. So let's scroll down. Um, Nissan was, in fact, Japan's first car manufacturer. Uh, they nearly went bankrupt in the late 1990s. Oh, sorry, there's a typo there. Should be get between uh, former and CEO, Carlos Ghosn. Carlos Ghosn came uh, from Renault. Previously, he'd been a senior executive in Michelin, then he moved to Renault. And he very much catalyzed uh, a big turnaround in Nissan. And significantly, he hired an outsider to become the chief creative officer, which was a new position and a, a snazzy title. Um, unprecedented in the Japanese car industry to take a, a staff member from a rival car manufacturer. Uh, he not only did that, but he took Nakamura Shiro from Isuzu, which status was, sorry, that should be from Isuzu. We've lost an F there, not from Isuzu. From Isuzu. Uh, he poached. Nakamura Shiro from Yasuzu, uh, he brought a very distinctive design uh, approach. Uh, Nakamura-san had uh, studied uh, both in Japan and abroad in, 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 in the US in a, in a particular boutique car design graduate program. So Nissan went through a process of asking themselves what was their distinctive DNA? What made Nissan Nissan? And of course, there's a Japan origin enterprise. And they went through a very elaborate process on this. I, I saw some of the internal presentations they did. Unfortunately, um, I don't have copies of their slides. They're internal. And at the time, they were, they were commercial and confidence. But one anecdote on this, um, precision kept coming up as one of the terms. Precision. We'll talk about this in a moment. This ideating process of trying to find adjectives which effectively describe. Um, precision was a key term. But then people said, no, but it's not German precision. You know, German precision is very metal. It's gears, it's cogs. And if we look at the image, for example, of Audi and uh, whatnot, they project a very cool precision. So in interrogating their own self-identity and customer perceptions, they thought, well, Japanese percep perceptions of Japanese precision is a little bit different, or at least their self-perceptions. -perce and so they, they wanted a more humanized, artisanal, a bit monozukuri kind of precision. So, of course, we tend to associate Japan recently and brand Japan with the materiality of wood. It's no accident that the Olympic Stadium, currently just locked away, waiting to be used, the Olympic Stadium has literally the, the trimmings of wood. Kengo Kuma, the architect, presented it as a wooden stadium. It's not a wooden stadium. It's a, um, it would burn and people would die. It would be insane to, you, you, can't, you can't build a wooden stadium. It effectively is a steel and concrete um, stadium trimmed with wood. But wood has this softness um, and uh, evokes traditional Japanese architecture and artisanship so there's a very clear material manifestation of Japan's at least self-identity. Of course, one of the ironies is the Japanese architects in the 60s and 70s actually became particularly famous for working in, in concrete and steel. Um, but we'll put that aside uh, for the moment. We'll come back to it. So in this process of ideating about what, in fact, Nissan's brand identity was, this materiality element, uh, a soft precision, arose. And one of the images they used to encapsulate that was, and I remember, very clearly remembered a striking image of fresh asparagus, uh, all the same size, perfect, um, beautifully cut and presented in a lacquer box um, as an idea of the Japanese sense of precision. So when you take on that self-narrative that we are a kind of a soft precise, that also manifests in terms of design features on the touch, the feel of, of, of how uh, the interfaces with the product uh, manifest. So we'll, we'll see, of course, one way that companies 
try and think about their own DNA, their own personality, their own uh, narratives of origins, is to go back into the back collection. And Nissan actually has a huge warehouse, and I've got some pictures here, a heritage collection. And if you are a Nissan shareholder or a long-term owner of a car, you can apply on certain open days to go and actually see all of these different models. And new employees, particularly those going into design and in marketing, can visit the Heritage Collection and get a sense of what, in fact, they have done in the past. So the, uh, the Z uh, was actually a return to a product identity that had existed in the past. The, it was called the Fair Lady. I'm feeling directly in English, of course. It sounds so 70s and highly gendered. But that's one reason why they focused on the, uh, on the Z. And Otto Mosan, who was the chap who headed the, uh, the development team for this, um, still a very senior executive with, with Nissan, he, uh, in the class once, said, Z narakori miyaki nai. And he was responsible for this, and he said it's really stood the, uh, the passage of time. I would love to have one of these, but it's, um, it's a two-seater, and that doesn't go down well when you have family. Okay, the uh, the GTO you can put kids in the back, but this is a serious muscle car. Um, similarly, the GTR had uh, it referenced an earlier sports model for Nissan. So the development of these two models really communicated that Nissan was returning to its origins as particularly sporty um, and a very clear point of differentiation from Toyota, which was a mass market company, uh, and of course a head-to-head -head challenge to Honda which had a very sporty image because uh, not only the nature of its product and iconic red cars in the past and whatnot, but also its association with um, Formula One. So the, uh, the case of the GTR, Carlos Ghosn explicitly told the managers that with this is a product we will not advertise. If this car does not sell by word of mouth, you have failed. It wasn't left entirely to accident, though. They actually did drive some of the cars around masked. They put a black mask across the front of it, uh, drove it through Shibuya and various places. In fact, they parked it and did all these strange events where they had ridiculously um, attractive Scandinavians models standing around with Batman-like masks on next to the car to kind of create a social media buzz and whatnot. But of course... You can do all of these things to design your brand positioning, but then you can lose control of your brands. This, of course, here is a um, Nissan pickup truck, which has been converted into um, military equipment in the Syrian civil war. They have um, mounted an anti-aircraft gun on the back of the thing, and off they're going. Um, of course, the other thing with Nissan, and those of you who just recently following the news of the company would know that the last uh, year and a half has been incredibly traumatic for Nissan with the um, dismissal of CEO Carlos Ghosn, his arrest. Um, many of those developments were prompted by his push to bring about a organizational merger with um, its largest shareholder, Renault, and there was very much a pushback internally. And of course, it's a he says, he says kind of thing. Um, there have been claims and counterclaims. And of course, Carlos Ghosn is particularly famous for having um, escaped Japan uh, just before New Year and uh, turned up in uh, Lebanon, where he then ran a media campaign, which is, um, uh, kind of been a, like an over the horizon bombing has been very, very effective um, in damaging the stature of Nissan and him projecting his own uh, perspective. So, of course, when uh, the media goes to talk about Nissan, uh, they reference some of those early iconic uh, cars. This is uh, an original GTR, and you see the way they've depicted it, of course. You can see the font there with the original GTR from the early 1970s is just exactly the same that we had. Um, on the, uh, the more modern version. So that's the, the positive and the negative elements. Okay. Now I would like to turn to... Let's check it. 
Okay, good. I'd like to turn to a discussion of two very successful New York cases in terms of the projection of brand personality. And let me share these straight away. Um, what I will say is both of them are New York cases from the Lower East Side, uh, and indeed their flagship store locations are within walking distance from each other. And if you get to go to New York, if you're in New York, um, now with uh, some of the, uh, the lockdown being lifted, uh, there is in the Lower East Side an excellent museum there, um, which shows life on the Lower East Side during the, uh, the peak of inbound migration, where it had one of the highest population densities uh, in the world. And one of the significant flows of migrants into the United States in the late 19th century and early 10th 20th century were Eastern European Jews, people who came from um, what is now parts of, of Russia, um, places like Lithuania, for example, um, Poland, very large Jewish communities and very distinctive uh, cultural identities associated with speaking Yiddish, which was a hybrid um, Hebrew Germanic language which is in danger of dying out but there are some revivalist efforts and whatnot both of these brands are associated with jewish migrants uh and i you'll see that they have very effectively been able to project their brand stories and of course that speaks to very diverse audiences So these two examples, one of them is Moscot, okay? And uh, the glasses I'm wearing are actually Moscot. Um, so the profile of brand, I actually like myself. And Russ and Daughters, very different companies. Um, Russ and Daughters was a Jewish deli uh, of longstanding fame over multi-generations and uh, has, more recently developed a, uh, a restaurant and is able to develop a chain of chain of restaurants. Um, and Moscot, of course, uh, has become uh, an extremely, well, because I weather myself, I'm hesitant to say it, but, but an extremely kind of funky brand. Um, one of the attractions of Moscot is it's not Luxottica. It has not been bought by Luxottica. Moscot explicitly say, this is the fifth generation of family ownership. We will continue to be in the family. We are not going to sell out to Luxottica like everybody else does. So if people want to get out of Luxottica world, um, that's one of the attractions with um, Moscot. But uh, Moscot, uh, for a long time, uh, has been a little known, but very popular brand with particularly New York identities. Now, this is, uh, this is actually in Madame Tussauds uh, Waxworks in London. Um, that's uh, Andy Warhol, but uh, they got in quite accurately there. And in particular, they got his glasses right. Now, I actually took this picture years ago because Andy Warhol is very famous for saying that everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame and very, very famous for his self-promotion and uh, a whole bunch of people who fell in with him at an early point. Yoyi Kusama, Tom Ford and many others got a good lesson in self-promotion. But I took this picture years ago and when I was looking around for 15 minutes of fame imagery to pull this out in the lecture notes, I suddenly realized, oh my God, he's wearing my glasses, okay? And that was quite sobering for me because I realized that somewhere along the way, I had obviously been interested in Andy Warhol. His glasses had caught my eye and somewhere back in the back of my brain, um, I remembered them and I liked them. So when I was in a Moscot store, these are actually from the, uh, their store in Aoyama, which the decor is remarkably like their Lower East Side New York store. Um, I saw them and thought, oh, they're wonderful, I've got to have them, and I got them. Um, in the New York store, I bought a pair of sunglasses instead. Um, so in a funny kind of way, our alertness to design, to visuality is often passive. It often, it often primes us, changes our tastes in ways that we're not compute, completely aware of until we come to a certain uh, decision point. So anyway, this is the, the Moscot brand, and they, have effectively created a very uh, analog, 
almost museum of artifacts in their store uh, to bring life to their narratives of origins, their particular ethos and the process of innovation. Um, the bicycle reference is that the founder of the business, uh, he originally imported glasses from Europe and then sold them in the city cheaply uh, from a cart on his bicycle. So this is a physical manifestation of a tale of origins. Um, this is how the flagship store looks in the evening when they're shut. Uh, very clear understanding that uh, when you're shut is also a branding opportunity as well too. We saw with the way the, uh, the store in Italy that was selling glassware lit up their store at night and made for a very alluring experience. Now, how did I first fall for the Moscot brand? I was walking down the street in New York in the evening and I thought, wow, that looks really interesting, that store. I went over to take a picture of it and then I looked in the window and I saw a pair of sunglasses. I thought, ah, oh, that's just the shape I've been looking for and haven't been able to find. I went back the next day, bought them and still have them and love them. Unfortunately, back in February in the rush to catch an aeroplane, I lost another pair of Moscot at Narita Airport. It cost me some Mongol cent. And I tried everything to get them back, but uh, clearly whoever found them didn't hand them in and thought, hmm, nice free Moscots. So never mind. Anyway, uh, so if you go to the store, you can find one of the original sales board and a whole bunch of pictures of um, the founders. They explicitly personalize it. And I think this is very important point for Japanese companies. Japanese companies, I think, are, are rather too modest. They often think that our customers would have no interest in knowing about the people behind our business. For employees, you often get the rundown on the founders and whatnot, and particularly the, uh, the storied company or also the venture. Indeed, inventions can go the other way in Japan. They can often become almost like a cult, unfortunately, around the, uh, the identity of the founder. But it takes a certain boldness to say, actually, this business started out very modestly, uh, but has become a very good thing. And why do we do this? It personalizes it. Again, to go to our starting point in terms of personality, we connect with individuals. And they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be like us. We just simply have been able to connect with them. I find this extraordinarily interesting, this tale of Eastern European Jewish migrants coming to New York, poor, um, making good, and building a business which is passed on from generation to generation. Now, I'm not Jewish. I uh, didn't grow up in New York, but it is a very persuasive, interesting story. And of course, with the, uh, the landmark times, this is an opportunity to, to really do interesting things. And of course, the graphics managed to capture this as well. Okay, so the 100 years, uh, as we see. Thank you.